from CMC Louisiana and BM Cardiology from CMC Bellor. This is the Echo Fellowship from 2012 to 2013 from the National Heart Center in Singapore. And uh, since then, he has worked at multiple mission hospitals and since 2019 at CMC Bellor to look after the Echo Lab over there. They perform close to 300 echoes a day. And Dr. Jason Kripa has a special interest in not only doing, but also teaching echocardiogram. I am happy to welcome Dr. Jason Kripa into our midst for what I am sure will be an exciting talk. Dr. Jason Kripa, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Chris, and uh, thank you, Dr. Lena, for those. Uh, profuse and very kind words of uh, welcome. I'm happy uh, to be here today uh, to just um, share a little bit of um, um, of what we know of echocardiography and how we use it in day-to-day mm -hmm. -day practice. Um, before I go on any further, I would just like to confirm that you can see my screen and I'm clearly audible. And for the benefit of all, it will be nice if um, each of us can keep our um, mics muted. Uh, Dr. Chris, Dr. Lena, am I audible? And uh, is my screen visible? Yes. yes, yes. All right. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I understand that today's audience, um, uh, you're all probably um, uh, junior doctors or uh, senior medical students. And uh, the idea of this talk is uh, at the end of it, uh, I don't want it to be a whole lot of um, knowledge uh, or information being thrown at you. But uh, my audience, I assume, um, is somebody who knows nothing about ECHO. Uh, hopefully, if you can go back with some idea about what this is, and you are able to make some basic interpretations, um, I think the purpose will be served uh, then. So uh, we'll begin with the planes. Um, all of us know that we have, uh, these are the planes um, in the body. You have the sagittal plane, you have the coronal plane, and you have the transverse plane. The same concept can be uh, translated onto the heart. Put your headphones. Yeah. Can I please request? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so we can um, extend the same idea to the heart, wherein uh, you can uh, divide the heart uh, into sagittal, coronal, or transverse uh, sections. And this forms, this logic forms the basis of all tomographic or uh, plane based uh, imaging. Whether it is echocardiography or CT or MRI, uh, they follow similar principles. Uh, so if we were to align the planes along the body, uh, the planes of the body, the ah, cut yes. would come out to be something. Yes. But we use the same idea uh, to uh, align along the axis of the heart, and we get different uh, kind of images. So if we cut the heart transversely, as has been shown here, then you get short axis views uh, that you see at the bottom. I'll just use a uh, pointer. Uh, so if you cut the heart transversely, you get short axis views. And the round thing is the left ventricle, and the other side, this is the right ventricle. If you cut it sagittally, then you get long axis views. Uh, so these are called long axis views or sagittal views. Uh, if you are using another imaging modality like a nuclear um, uh, scan or a cardiac MRI, then they use a different terminology. But essentially, the principle is the same. You are cutting it along the long axis of the heart. You can cut the heart coronally, uh, and that would be through the apex. And that will give you apical views, a four-chamber view, uh, two-chamber view, and so on and so forth. Uh, that is about the planes of the heart. Now, to image the heart, you need certain windows. So every room generally has windows. You can look from outside what is there inside the room if your window is clean. Uh, if it's a nice transparent glass, you will be able to see what is there inside the room very easily. Uh, 
whereas if the window is very dirty then you can't see things well so uh, in the chest also we have these spaces uh, which are intercostal spaces and uh, if there is no lung disease if the uh, chest wall is not very thick then we will be able to see the heart very nicely and we say the patient has a good window otherwise we say the patient has a poor echo window so we as a, image the heart from parasternal windows generally generally on the left side it can be also done from the right side in certain situations routinely we also use the subcostal window and the suprasternal window so parasternal apical subcostal right parasternal suprasternal so these are all just um, uh, spaces or areas uh, from where we can image the heart now uh, patient's position now you might have seen some people do it from the right side as has been shown in this picture some people may do it from the left side and um, uh, that is of course a matter of training and personal comfort also but certain basic uh, things that uh, are worth uh, knowing uh, the pros and cons so for someone who images from the right side like this um, the advantage is the patient is facing towards the left side so especially at a time like this during covid and all uh, the patient is not directly breathing on to your face so that is one major advantage second advantage of course is it's easier for right handed people and most of the world is uh, right handed uh, the advantage of scanning from the left side is that you use the left hand that is obvious but you don't twist your spine uh, to reach over the patient like this so chronic back injury um, which is a problem with echocardiographers is less of a problem if you scan from the left side so that is just to kind of uh, have an idea now echocardiography like everything else also has various societies in the world including one in india uh, there is one in uh, america there is uh, one for europe and there are so many such societies the idea of putting this slide up is to tell you that for everything that i say right now or the images uh, there are standard guidelines and uh, what we do is generally based on uh, these uh, guidelines uh, so the first view Uh, generally is the parasternal long axis view or the sagittal view as i kind of uh, showed you uh, what is shown here uh, is uh, a view with increased depth now what does that mean uh, that the heart generally appears small in this view and you are able to see deeper structures also so this is a preliminary view uh, that you take because you want to rule out is there any pleural effusion is there a mass behind the heart um, is there something else in the aorta uh, all of those things just a general panoramic uh, view is the first view that you take uh, increase depth uh, it's a scout view you just want to get a general idea what are the structures i will come to uh, in a bit so in this particular view uh, you can pick up pericardial effusion you can pick up uh, pleural effusions and how do you distinguish the two uh, the pericardial effusion generally with a stop with the descending thoracic aorta as has been shown here whereas anything which crosses or goes even behind the descending thoracic aorta uh, is likely to be a pleural effusion and why is that that is because uh if we remember anatomy the reflection of the pericardium is against the descending thoracic aorta so it cannot cross the descending thoracic aorta uh now coming to the structures itself in this view um as has been shown so every image that i show there's a picture uh, on the left and it kind of explains things so this is the parasternal long axis view what you see here is the interventricular septum this is the left ventricle which opens into the aorta through the aortic valve that you see here what you see here is the mitral valve um it has the anterior mitral leaflet here and it has the posterior mitral leaflet so this is the left atrium which empties into the left ventricle through the mitral valve this is also called the posterior wall of the left ventricle or uh, currently it is called the infralateral wall separating the left ventricle and the right ventricle is the interventricular septum 
And this right ventricle, right ventricle again has many parts. This is called the right ventricular outflow tract, RVOT. This circular structure here is the descending thoracic aorta, which is generally seen behind the left atrium. Uh, so how did we get that view? Now, uh, if you are sitting here and you are not exposed to echo or have never seen echoes, uh, you might have been, you might be wondering, as I was um, uh, till uh, some time back, about how this view came into uh, existence. So it's essentially a sagittal section of the heart. Um, so assume that the patient is lying on the left lateral position, the heart is made to uh, lie in the left lateral position, you are cutting the heart sagittally. And what you see here on the left end is the left ventricular apex. And what you see at the other end is the aorta. What you see anteriorly or on top will be the right ventricle. And what you see um, lower will be posterior. So that is how the uh, picture comes into existence. So just to show the same thing about how this image was generated. Again, um, uh, going through the structures uh, that I just mentioned, anatomical uh, specimen here. This is the left atrioventricular groove, and in the left and in the left atrioventricular groove lies the coronary sinus, and also the left circumflex artery. So uh, sometimes if the sometimes uh, can I just request uh, uh, the mics to be muted? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so this is in the left atrioventricular groove, and what you can see here is the coronary sinus. That if it is dilated, like in um, um, many conditions, cause uh, coronary sinus dilatation. That can be seen in this particular space here as a circular rounded structure in the left atrioventricular group. Otherwise, the structures mentioned, left atrium here, left ventricle, interventricular septum, the left ventricular outflow tract, which opens through the aortic valve into the aorta. So that is uh, all the different structures. Now, um, in echocardiography, we take measurements. How do we take measurements? That is what has been kind of uh, shown here. Uh, we take it in systole, we take it in diastole. The left ventricle is measured in systole and diastole. The frame on the left is in diastole. The frame on the right is in systole. Uh, and obviously, you can see that the diameter is smaller in systole because the left ventricle ejects blood through the aortic valve, and hence the diameter becomes uh, smaller. Now, likewise, the volume also reduces in uh, systole. Now, how do we measure? There's a specific way to measure it. I won't go into too much technical details, but uh, I'll touch on a few things. Uh, so, uh, like all measurements in echo, uh, and measurements otherwise, we generally use landmarks. So generally, this left ventricular diameter is measured at the level of the tip of the mitral valve because uh, you need landmarks. Uh, suppose I measure something here. The next time somebody else measures, they may measure it somewhere in here. So each time your measurement is going to vary unless you have landmarks. So landmarks are important. And... Um, uh, so it is measured at the tip of the mitral valve, and what you um, uh, you can measure it in 2D like this in the uh, in diastolic frame, as has been shown here. It's highlighted here in the uh, ECG also. And what has been measured here is the end systolic frame, uh, as has been shown here on the ECG. Otherwise, if you don't have an ECG, simply the largest and the smallest would correspond to end diastolic and end systolic. Measurements uh, that are done here, namely, number one, interventricular septum in um, diastole, left ventricular internal diameter in diastole, posterior wall in diastole, and the right ventricular dimension in diastole. And this is the left ventricular internal diameter in systole. Now you can notice that uh, no cordae, no papillary muscles, none of those things are seen. Uh, in, it's a nice, clean, black uh, ventricle with uh, the muscles uh, and other structures seen in white. Now, why is that uh, important? Uh, it is important uh, to get these kind of clear views because um, along the interventricular septum, you can have septal cordae from the tricuspid valve. 
you can have the moderator band in the right ventricle you can have the papillary muscle from the tricuspid uh, apparatus all of that can give a sense of the interventricular septum being thickened and uh, if we are not careful about measuring properly then we can give a wrong reading and the implications can be many um, there can be unnecessary downstream investigations like cardiac mri or uh, wrong diagnosis like uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and so on and so forth so that is the importance of um, measuring correctly and uh, knowing what can give a false reading now this picture here there are two pictures one is correct the one on the left is correct the one on the right is uh, not correct now why is it not correct i told you when you are taking the left ventricle you should not see any papillary muscle subcordae uh, that is uh, as has been shown here on the right side so the cut that has been taken uh, is off center is off center so this is the left ventricle here this is the right ventricle here Uh, so here the cut has been taken such uh, that it gives the papillary muscles which means you are not in the center of the ventricle which means that your left ventricular dim uh, dimension is not the largest uh, you are underestimating the diameter uh, whereas if you take it right in the center of the left ventricle it is only cavity and you don't have any wall structures and that is the largest uh diameter so that's a bit of uh, technical um uh, information now uh, i told you that this is the long axis plane uh, so this um, is the left ventricle here in short axis this is the right ventricle this is the interventricular septum separating the right and the left ventricle uh, your um, aorta would come something uh, aortic valve would come somewhere here and this is the axis which cuts through sagittally to give you this particular long axis so in relation to the sagittal plane you can have a four chamber view uh, which cuts through both the ventricles that is the left ventricle and the right ventricle cuts through both the mitral valve as the as the tricuspid valve uh, which i will subsequently show you shortly and this would be the two chamber view which does not cut through the right ventricle so a two chamber view only shows two chambers that is the left atrium and the left ventricle that also i will show you subsequent images but it is important to know whether it is cardiac ct cardiac mri uh, echo uh, they are all follow this concept of cutting the heart in different planes and getting images um and so uh, that is uh, that now uh, i have shown the same thing looking at the heart from the top so the atria have been removed so left atrium has been removed from here right atrium has been removed from here and you are seeing the heart from the top and so this is how you will see it the pulmonary valve being most anterior then you see the aortic valve with its cusps then you uh, see the left um, atrium or the mitral valve here on the left side and uh, you see the tricuspid valve here what will come here on top will be the interatrial septum and uh, between the ventricles you will have the interventricular septum um posterior around here along the posterior mitral annulus you will see the coronary sinus and i'll also um, now if you try to correlate i showed you the parasternal long axis view and the posterior structure in the atrioventricular groove was the coronary sinus because the coronary sinus comes like this and drains into the right atrium just below the uh, or, or uh, just above the tricuspid valve now um this is looking at the heart from the apex that is from the ventricular side so it is going to look the opposite of how it is going to look from the top that is from the basal side or from the atrial side it is going to look like this from the ventricular side or from the apical side it's going to look like that again in short axis uh, view so you get the long axis view going through both ventricles you get the four chamber plane going through only the left ventricle and the left atrium you get the two chamber plane so that is about the planes of the heart now i told you about correct measurements uh, so sometimes in the elderly and all you can have this kind of uh, basal uh, interventricular septal bulge now if you measure like has been measured here your impression will be asymmetrical septal hypertrophy um and somebody will call it hypertrophic cardiomyopathy 
Um, uh, whereas you know that that particular septal thickness does not represent the entire interventricular septum. So you should measure it a little away from uh, that particular bulge. Um, so that is again um, important when you are measuring, when we are doing measurements. The other measurements that we will take in this view are uh, the right ventricular outflow tract, the left atrium, as has been shown here. Right ventricular outflow tract, will you will take it from the hinge point of the aorta and the interventricular septum uh, straight up to the summit of the right ventricular outflow tract. And uh, likewise, the left atrium also, you will take the maximum left atrial diameter, which will be in end systole, as has been shown here. So the pulmonary veins drain into it. Um, and it is largest in systole, waiting for the mitral valve to open in diastole, and then the left atrium uh, empties into the left ventricle in diastole. And um, in diastole, the left atrial diameter becomes smaller. So this is kind of opposite of what is happening in the ventricle. So the left atrium is largest in end systole, uh, the left ventricle is waiting to catch what the left atrium is going to give. And then the left ventricle fills and it becomes larger. Uh, and that is uh, in left ventricular diameter is larger in diastole. Uh, now, uh, you must have heard about uh, something called M mode. So we are still in the parasternal long axis view. Uh, whatever I told you was two dimensional. Uh, now we are going to talk about something called M mode or motion mode. So these are the kind of images that are generated. So you can see that there is this small line, um, uh, which is the cursor, the small line here. And likewise, there is this small line here and a small line here. You can notice that uh, it is all at different positions. So here we are cutting through the right ventricular outflow tract here, through the aortic valve and through the left atrium. So hence what you get here in time. So this x-axis is time and this y-axis is the structures that you are seeing. So from top, you will see the right ventricle here. You will see the iota here in the middle, and you will see the left atrium here at the bottom. Um, so that is because it is cut in that direction. So this is something like an ice pick view. So you have an ice pick and you just tab uh, it right through. And this is the kind of image that will be generated over time. Likewise, if you move this cursor towards uh, the LV at the level of the tip of the mitral valve, what you will see here is again from top right ventricle here, interventricular septum in the middle, anterior mitral leaflet first, then posterior mitral leaflet, and then the posterior wall of the LV. So that is exactly what we are seeing here. In time, whatever is largest would be diastole, whatever is small here would be systole. So this, this is systole. You can kind of uh, correlate this with the ECG also. Uh, from the QRS till the end of the T wave, that would be systole, and you can see that the LV also becomes smaller here. Uh, from the end of the T wave till the QRS here would be the diastole, and all diastolic events are happening here. So the mitral valve, I told you, opens in diastole, so this is the early opening phase of the mitral valve. This is the phase of diastasis, and this is when the atrium kicks in, or the atrial pump, or the atrial contraction, or the atrial booster. So what you can see here it, is that it will generally follow the P wave. So the P wave comes, which is atrial depolarization. And following that, you have mechanical contraction. So that is how it will happen. Uh, so you have the early filling phase of the left ventricle, then the phase of diastasis, then you have atrial contraction. So this is called the E wave. This is called the A wave, all happening in diastole. This happens in early diastole. This happens in late diastole. So if you know the cardiac cycle, then it's very easy to correlate what is happening. Likewise, here, this is systole. The pink markers is systole, QRS to the end of the T. And in systole, we know the LV contracts and the aortic valve opens. And what you see here is an open aortic valve. This uh, box here is an open aortic valve, which subsequently closes in diastole. 
And likewise, I just told you that the left atrial dimension is largest at end systole. End systole is the end of the T wave. And you see that this diameter here is the largest. You move the cursor a little more towards the LV and you don't see any mitral valve. Uh, I have already kind of gone through the different events. So what you see large here is will be diastole. What you see small here will be uh, systole. Um, I think I will, um, this is just about uh, measurements. Uh, so uh, what do we do with these measurements? So now there are normal values. I've just put it on here. This is not uh, for you to memorize or for us to remember, uh, but to know that these kind of measurements exist, uh, they are generated from different populations. And um, roughly we, sh we should know that the interventricular septum in males would be somewhere around uh, 10 millimeters. In females, the upper limit is nine millimeters. We should have an idea about the diameters, uh, about what beyond which we will call it uh, dilatation. Uh, from there on, uh, we move on to the zoomed views. Uh, so this, this is the zoomed view. This, we are still at parasternal long axis view. This is still the anterior mitral leaflet. This is the interventricular septum. And this is zoomed at the level of the uh, aortic valve. Now, uh, what is zooming actually? Zooming is not merely magnifying. Okay. Uh, so you have a certain sector size, which has a certain number of pixels. And um, it is not just simply blowing up the parasternal long axis view to, uh, to kind of just show this. Uh, zooming essentially means that for the same amount of pixels, you are uh, kind of uh, uh, seeing a limited amount of information, which means that this particular structure is going to appear much clearer as compared to uh, if you were seeing it along with the rest of the structures like the left ventricle, posterior wall, mitral valve, left atrium, are we everything? So this is an important principle in echocardiography. If you want to see something better, uh, the spatial resolution uh, becomes better if you zoom it. Uh, why is that important? Because if you are looking for, uh, for example, if somebody asks you, this person has been having fever for uh, prolonged fever, please tell us if there are vegetations or not. Then you need to zoom it to see whether there are uh, vegetations or not, you will be able to see it much better. Or uh, so and so, this particular patient has come with a stroke. Uh, we want to rule out a, a cardioembolic um, uh, phenomenon. So you have looked for everything and you are looking at the aortic valve. You, know, you want to know whether there is a, a small tumor called a papillary fibroelastoma. And that uh, you will know if you zoom and you visualize the aortic valve uh, clearly. The other reason why you zoom is to take measurements. And the uh, way to take measurements is to keep the aortic valve open and systole like this. And then you take it at the hinge point. Uh, the hinge point here and the hinge point here is a very important echo measurement. It is called the LVOT diameter or the aortic analysis. And it's one of the most basic measurements in echocardiography. Uh, so that is uh, that is how you measure it. That is, um, uh, once you measure it, you have a diameter. Once you have a diameter, you can use pi r square. That will give you the area of the LVOT. Uh, and the area of the LVOT or the area of the aortic annulus. Uh, and clinically, it is Im very important from sizing aortic valves to, uh, uh, to nowadays TAVI valves. Uh, to calculating flows across the aortic valve, what is the stroke volume, everything depends on this measurement. And the significance of uh, measuring correctly. Uh, so this brings us to a very important thing in life, um, is about integrity in measurements and measuring correctly. So one is knowing how to measure. Second thing is also knowing that measurements have consequences. So uh, you may say that uh, you know your measurement is off by only a millimeter. But uh, for example, in the LVOT, if you were to calculate the area, uh, you are going to completely be off because pi r square, every millimeter error is going to be squared. Uh, so how did we arrive at all these? Uh, I'm not going into the formula. Uh, but suffice us to know and tell that if your LVOT is shaped like this and you choose to measure wherever you like and not at the analysis, 
uh, in a given patient with aortic stenosis, your aortic valve area can range from 0.44 to 1.35. So that is the importance of knowing how how much of a difference you can make if your measurements are not uh, correct. All right. Um, then uh, we go on to uh, certain other measurements. Uh, that is, this is the sino, uh, sinus of Valsalva, uh, you, uh, which uh, is measured here. This is the sinotubular junction. And beyond that, you have the ascending aorta. This is all still at the parasternal long axis view. Your LV is here, your mitral valve is here, interventricular septum still here. This is the aortic valve leaflets that you are uh, seeing. Uh, you go up one space higher and you see the iota much better. So this is the aortic valve, the sino, uh, sinus of Valsalva, the narrow part, the waist here is the sinotubular junction. The ascending iota is what we are seeing here. And uh, this view gives us information about dissections, about uh, uh, aneurysms um, and things like that. Again, for us to know that there are different uh, tables, charts, nomograms, um, uh, which are available uh, from different society guidelines and recommendations, which we routinely follow. <laughs> now, uh, now, like we uh, zoomed and looked at the aortic valve, we, we can do the same for other valves. Uh, so this is the mitral valve, which is shown here, the anterior mitral leaflet here, and the posterior mitral leaflet shown here. Uh, we use um, color. Now, color is not uh, to tell us whether it is arterial or venous. There is a color scale that is shown here. It tells us the direction of flow. So uh, your probe is here. Uh, whatever is red or towards red means that the flow is towards the probe. Whatever is uh, shown in blue uh, tells us that the flow is away from the probe. I will, If time permits, maybe towards the end, I'll uh, just... Um, kind of uh, show an image of two or two to illustrate what I just uh, mentioned. So it is basically to show the direction of flow. This red and blue is essentially to show us the direction of flow. Um, so some, uh, there is a color compare feature in most echocardiography machines, wherein you can use it to uh, use color on one frame uh, or um, one picture and the other one is without color. And that helps you kind of um, compare along with the anatomical structures that you are seeing. So for example, this is the aortic valve in short axis. Uh, I'll come to it and I'll tell you what uh, cusp is what. Uh, we are still at the parasternal long axis view, and this is the right ventricular outflow tract. Uh, what is shown here, this is the pulmonary artery. This is the right ventricular outflow tract, and right ventricular outflow tract to the pulmonary uh, artery. In between, you see the pulmonary valve. Uh, this is the, What you see here is the left ventricle. So that is the RVOT view. Again, very important, so certain diameters like the diameter of the pulmonary annulus, especially when somebody has a pulmonary stenosis and you want to do a pulmonary valvotomy, this is a view that you will use to measure the pulmonary annulus. Or you want to see what the flows are, uh, um, uh, the stroke volume is across the pulmonary valve or across the right ventricular outflow tract. Like we measured for left ventricular outflow tract, we would do the same for the right ventricular outflow tract as well. Now the right ventricular inflow view, uh, the right ventricular inflow view shows the right atrium and the right ventricle and the tricuspid leaflets in between. So what you see here is the tricuspid valve. This is the anterior tricuspid leaflet and this would usually be the posterior tricuspid leaflet. But if you see part of the left ventricle as in this particular case, then this becomes the <laughs> interventricular septum between the two leaflets and hence this becomes the septal tricuspid leaflet if you completely uh, obliterate or don't show the left ventricle then uh, this becomes the posterior uh, tricuspid leaflet <coughs> excuse me uh, you are seeing with color doppler as i told you earlier whatever flow is in blue <coughs> or a mosaic is toward is away from the transducer so your transducer is here or your probe is here whatever is going towards the probe is in red so there is flow happening towards the transducer uh, in red um, so uh, that is in diastole 
when the tricuspid valve opens, you see forward flow. But in systole, the opposite is happening. There is something happening in systole. There is regurgitation. <laughs> there is backflow. There is turbulent flow uh, that you are seeing. So that is how we assess regurgitations across valves. <clears throat> Um, uh, so again, coming to the uh, different planes, uh, this is I, I already kind of um, covered. And uh, from here, uh, I rotate my transducer to move towards the left shoulder to give me short axis plane. So as you can see, this is the short axis view at the base of the heart. It is right up there. And at that level, I'm seeing the great vessels. I'm seeing the aortic valve. I'm seeing the pulmonary valve here. I'm seeing a the tricuspid valve here, this is the right atrium, left atrium, interatrial septum. Uh, and as I slide my probe down, I will see more of left ventricle and right ventricle. This idea, I will just illustrate using some images. So right now, I'm still high up at the level at the base of the heart. I'm seeing the great arteries. This is the pulmonary valve. This is the pulmonary artery. This is the aortic valve right here in the middle. This is the right ventricular outflow tract. Now, <clears throat> I can kind of move my probe a little here and there to kind of either show the valve nicely, like in this case, uh, the pulmonary valve is also seen, the pulmonary artery is seen, and now I'm seeing a bit of the branching also. The right pulmonary artery would come here and the left pulmonary artery would go uh, that side. Now, uh, what are the different cusps that I see here? Uh, this uh, th there are three cusps that I see. This would be the right coronary cusp. Uh, the right coronary cusp is closest to the right ventricular outflow tract. So that would be the right coronary cusp. This is the non-coronary cusp. So the non-coronary cusp is one of the posterior cusps, but the identification is it is related to the interatrial septum. So now all these things are important landmarks, both surgically and uh, interventionally. Uh, when we are doing interventions in the art, um, what I'm saying uh, is all very important. Uh, so this is the non-coronary cusp. This then is the left coronary cusp. So the right coronary cusp is anterior in relation to the right ventricular outflow tract, non-coronary cusp in relation to the interatrial septum. And what is left is the left coronary cusp. Uh, I'll skip over that. Again, uh, telling us how to measure. This would be the right ventricular outflow tract proximally. This is the pulmonary annulus. This is the main pulmonary artery. Now, <coughs> um, this is the uh, this is what we call as pulse wave Doppler. Pulse wave Doppler put very simply measures velocities at a given a given point. So you can see that my cursor is here. At this point, it measures velocities. And looking at the pattern of how this pulse wave Doppler is, we can uh, get an idea about what the pulmonary vascular resistance is, what the stroke volume across the right ventricular outflow tract is, etc. So much of information we can get. Uh, hopefully, I'll be able to illustrate it with a few examples. Uh, this is continuous wave Doppler, uh, which measures uh, velocities all through all the line of interrogation. So it measures velocities here, here, here. Whatever is the maximum velocity is what is going to be represented here. So what has been shown here in systole, uh, this is systole, this phase, this is forward flow in systole across the pulmonary valve from the ventricle. And uh, uh, if, there, uh, if there is pulmonary stenosis, this velocity will be grossly increased. This obviously is a normal valve and normal uh, velocity. Uh, the same thing again, uh, if you want to see different structures, then you kind of move it, you zoom it, and you see the different structures here. So this is the pulmonary valve, pulmonary artery, right pulmonary artery, and the left pulmonary artery there. I already told you about the different cusps uh, in the iota. I will uh, kind of um, uh, skip over this. Coming down to the level of the left ventricle, this is the left ventricle at the level of the mitral valve. So we have come from the aortic valve level at the base of the heart uh, down to the level of the mitral valve. 
uh, what you see here is the interventricular septum. This is whole thing is the left ventricle. What you see here on top is the right ventricle. You go down a little further towards the apex. Uh, apex and uh, so this is just anatomical specimens moving from the uh, base of the heart at the level of the aortic valve to the um, left ventricular outflow tract down to the level of the mitral valve and we are still continuing to move um, down further to the level of the papillary muscles what you see here is the anterolateral papillary muscle what you see here is the postromedial uh, papillary muscle they have their specific positions. This would generally be at 4 o'clock position. This would generally be at 8 o'clock position. Using this information, um, there is, uh, we can tell whether uh, somebody has a single papillary muscle, somebody has an abnormal location of the papillary muscle, somebody has uh, more papillary muscles than they should be having, uh, so on and so forth. But the basic understanding is extremely uh, important. Now we go towards the LV apex, and as you'll see, the LV apex, uh, you don't see any right ventricle at all. So anatomical section, again, from the level of the papillary muscle going down towards the uh, LV apex. Here you are seeing right ventricle, right ventricle, RV, RV. At the level of the LV apex, uh, your image should not show any RV at all, unless the RV is uh, dilated. So that is how we did it. We cut first at the level of the great Arteries, that is the level of the aortic valve, pulmonary valve, sl uh, slid it down all the way to the apex. And we took different, it's like chopping an apple or a fruit uh, in parallel sections. So that is what exactly what we have done using a probe as a knife, we have uh, done to get different kinds of images. Um, uh, this is the four chamber view, uh, and uh, it, this is intuitively the simplest view to understand because you see the heart uh, four chambers, except that it is upside down. Your probe is here at the LV apex. So, this is the LV apex. This is the left ventricle. Um, this is the mitral valve. Left atrium empties into the left ventricle through the mitral valve. This is the interventricular septum, which partitions the left ventricle and the right ventricle. Likewise, the interatrial septum partitions the left atrium and the right atrium. The right atrium empties into the right ventricle through the tricuspid valve. And uh, there are different things we can make out um, using uh, this particular view. So, for example, um, uh, if the LV is dilated, we will be able to see that. If there is a defect in the interventricular septum, we will be able to see that. If there is a defect in the interatrial septum, we will be able to see that. If the mitral valve doesn't open well and is restricted, we will call it mitral stenosis, um, uh, so on and uh, so forth. Now, how did we get that view again? Uh, this is how the heart lies. I have made it to stand erect, uh, and that is how the heart will then lie. The heart is, um, has been uh, opened uh, to show it standing vertically. Uh, then I have flipped it up uh, to get my four-chamber view. So that is uh, how I got my four-chamber view, because I am imaging upside down from the apex. Um, I've just kind of uh, highlighted uh, the left ventricle here to show it better in the four-chamber view. Then I come on to the two-chamber view. As I told you, I will see only two chambers. That is the left atrium here, mitral valve here, left ventricle here, and uh, I see no more. I don't see any right ventricular structures. If I do, then that is no longer a two-chamber view. It is some kind of a modified uh, view. So in this particular view, I see different structures. This is the anterior wall. This is the inferior wall. So that is the walls of the left ventricle. Likewise, uh, this is the three-chamber view. Uh, or the, uh, it is similar to the parasternal long axis view. This would be the interventricular septum. This is the right ventricular outflow tract. This is the left ventricle. This is the mitral valve again. So this is the anterior interventricular septum. This is the infralateral wall anterior interventricular septum infralateral wall. I kind of missed uh, mentioning what um, the different walls are here. This would be the inferior septum of the interventricular uh, septum, and this is the anterolateral wall. Anterolateral wall, inferior septum. Um, 
this is all a little kind of uh, maybe a little uh, overwhelming when i just mention names like that but uh, i'll spend a minute on this particular schematic to kind of um, uh, before proceeding further uh, with the permission of the moderator uh, can i maybe take uh, another 5 to 7 minutes is that okay please sir go ahead yeah uh, so um, what you can see here is the different coronary distribution so this is the left main coronary artery which uh, divides into the left anterior descending artery in the interventricular groove um and uh, that sends uh, septal branches perpendicularly into the interventricular septum uh, and that is the um, um, so the interventricular septum has septal branches from the left anterior descending artery this is the atrioventricular groove the right atrioventricular groove has the right coronary artery the left atrioventricular groove has the left circumflex artery as has been shown here so the important thing to know here is that the plane of the interventricular septum is perpendicular to the atrioventricular groove or the plane of the atrioventricular groove so they are in two different planes which are perpendicular to each other okay so that is the first thing to know the other thing is the left anterior descending artery uh, sends septal branches into the interventricular septum it sends diagonal branches which are on the surface of the heart so again <coughs> that's an important thing to uh, know now coming to the distribution um what is seen in green is the left anterior descending artery what is seen in uh, pink is the circumflex artery what is seen in blue is the right coronary artery um i'll just uh, kind of quickly so if uh, i get a view and this particular part of the heart is not moving then i know that there's a problem with the lad or the left anterior descending artery if i know if i see that this particular part is not moving then i say that it is the right coronary artery which is at fault if i see that uh, this is not moving then uh, i'm in a fix uh, or rather i need to look further um then it can either be left circumflex or the left anterior descending artery that is why i use other views now if i get a view here wherein all of this is moving well and only this part is not moving then i know that this is a part which is supplied either by the circumflex or the right coronary artery and not by the lad so if i see that this part is not moving this part is not moving then i conclude that it is a circumflex coronary artery problem or a circumflex coronary artery occlusion so that is how i that is an approach now the paucity of time i cannot be very comprehensive on this but that is how i kind of logical a conclusion about which coronary artery uh, might be uh, involved i will just um, uh, show a case or two and then i will uh, stop so this is a gentleman 51 year old um, who has chest pain for uh, two hours you can see there is a elevation in the anterior leads here so that makes it an anterior wall myocardial infarction um i've just put uh, one view here and to just show that this is the circumflex coronary artery this is the left anterior descending artery which should be going like that uh, which has been occluded and this patient has undergone a stenting and uh, subsequently this opens up so you see the entire flow now what you are seeing here is a diagonal what you are seeing here is the anterior descending artery and what you are seeing here is the left circum so this you can imagine if you try to correlate is something like a short axis view which i just showed you a while ago short axis view at the level of the base of the heart um showing the aortic valve showing the pulmonary valve um, you can kind of overlap this onto that and then try to understand Uh, all the so your left lv uh, short axis view uh, will be kind of um, uh, so you have your lv short axis view and you have your lad uh, being supplied here your circumflex artery being supplied uh, somewhere here uh, so if you try to correlate both these views so it's an anterior wall mi so i don't expect a problem anywhere here or here i my problem expected would be somewhere here would be somewhere here somewhere here and somewhere here so let's see what the echo shows 
So this is a four chamber view. And um, if you are not able to see this very well, I have given what I call as a left ventricular opacification contrast. Uh, the white is the cavity, the black is the wall. And as you can see, this wall is all circumflex territory contracting well. This is contracting OK. This part is not contracting well. This part is not contracting well. I hope you are able to appreciate there's a different on how this part is contracting and how this part is contracting. This is abnormal. This is normal. This is left anterior descending artery infarct or an anterior wall um, myocardial infarction. The two chamber view, this is the anterior wall, which is not moving as well as the inferior wall. This is the inferior wall moving very nicely, anterior wall not moving nicely. Similarly, this is the anterior interventricular septum not moving so well, inferior wall or infralateral wall moving very well. So uh, that is how we kind of, um, it kind of fits in. This is again is the anterior interventricular septum moving well, not move, uh, sorry, not moving well, this is moving well. So that's a very gross way of kind of telling um, um, this patient subsequently down the line improves and you can see that this anterior interventricular septum which was initially not moving so well subsequently begins to move well. So that is the approach to how we assess wall motion abnormalities and what they mean uh, in practice. Um, I think uh, in the interest of time I think I will kind of uh, uh, stop. I will take any questions there are other things also. Hopefully, uh, I can kind of continue on another day. Um, uh, over to the moderators. First of all, let me thank Dr. Jaisal Prupa for this exciting session. It was actually a session that really piqued your interest in echocardiography. I'm uh, just very thankful to say it. Obviously, very clear from Dr. Jesse Kripa's talk that he is, uh, he loves what he does and uh, he's excited to teach us about it. So, I'm very thankful for Dr. Jesse Kripa for coming, giving us a thought elevating and exciting talk on the topic. Um, as a physician, there's, uh, there's a great deal of uh, desire that we have to know more about echocardiography. <laughs> we, uh, we could do it ourselves at uh, the machines. Uh, we could learn it more. And uh, I mean, other than depending on, I mean, of course, we need experts to do it. But is there any way that a lay, uh, an echo naive doctor or technician could quickly get adept at uh, doing echoes, at least the very basics? So, Things I'm looking for are things like IBC collapsibility, uh, LB ejection fraction, RARB dilatation. Is it possible for someone who's echo nine to quickly get comfortable with those, with a few things in echo without uh, getting too technical about it? Is it possible to eyeball a few of these things? Absolutely. Uh, thank you once again, um, uh, Dr. Chris, for those words. Um, the whole idea of uh, uh, why I kind of chose to also um, stick to some uh, basics, uh, knowing the audience also, is uh, to kind of uh, enable all of us to understand that um, uh, this is not, uh, or rather sh uh, should not be understood as uh, uh, something in the domain of experts or something in the domain of uh, only uh, somebody who is very well trained to do it. Uh, even as a medical student, your understanding of physiology, your understanding of anatomy um, it can be enhanced manifold if uh, there is a kind of correlation with echo or uh, some other cross-sectional imaging like MRI or things like that. Which is why uh, even medical students, uh, I think uh, there is no, there should be no barrier why you cannot and should not learn uh, many of these things. It doesn't need to be reserved for a later date, ideally. Uh, systemically, there may be things that we might find difficult to kind of uh, implement or move with. But ideally speaking, there is, there's, there's no reason why uh, a final year or a fourth year medical student uh, who is learning mitral stenosis uh, cannot see it 
and correlate um, uh, with the cardiac cycle about uh, what exactly is happening. So that is one point. Uh, so extending from that point, uh, going on further, my passion is also to uh, demystify and democratize many of the things that we do in ECHO, especially at the level of the technicians. Only then we can uh, kind of reduce the cost for a vast country like ours. Only then we can allow this to percolate to the interiors of the country, um, where ordinary people also will be able to understand and uh, do it reasonably well. Uh, that leads me to what Dr. Chris was asking. Can uh, can we assess uh, ejection fraction or IVC? Uh, these are all questions of day-to-day -day importance for management of heart failure. Um, uh, and, and that is just one, uh, one thing that he kind of uh, mentioned. Like this, there can be so many things. And absolutely, yes, it can be the extension of the stethoscope for you as a physician in your wards. And uh, the the fine tuning or the finer things can certainly be verified by somebody more experienced. Uh, but the approach should be start with the medical student, uh, uh, get the techs involved, uh, get more and more people at the grassroots uh, aware of um, what this thing is about. And uh, then I think um, our um, um, uh, this uh, this technology or this thing will be optimally um, and well utilized. So, yeah. Only questions I, am, uh, I really want to ask, but I want to defer to the questions that have been asked in the chat already. So, uh, one of the first questions that we got in the chat is: Can estimating left ventricular filling pressure be an alternative to LVOT measure for measuring cardiac output? Um, I think, um, thanks for that question. Um, so the left ventricular filling pressure, uh, put very simply, we are just assessing left atrial pressure. Okay, uh, now that without getting into the technical details of pulmonary capillary wedge pressure or uh, mean left atrial pressure or LV end diastolic pressure, uh, there, are, there are minor differences between all of that, but let's, for the sake of this discussion, say that um, uh, left ventricular filling pressure essentially means that the pressure at which the left ventricular left ventricle fills, which means it is the left atrial pressure. The left ventricle can fill only if the left atrium uh, has a certain pressure, otherwise it is not going to fill. So that is the left atrial pressure. Now that uh, being an alternate to LVOT measure for measuring cardiac output, I think they are uh, two slightly different things. Um, so unless uh, there is a condition in which um, left ventricle is not filling properly at all, like a severe restrictive cardiomyopathy in end stages, uh, you can have a markedly elevated left atrial pressure and it, is, uh, it may manifest in end stages as a low cardiac output. Uh, so the two are different things, actually. They may be related, but um, uh, not in every patient. As in every patient with a left atrial elevated pressure may not necessarily have a low stroke volume or a low uh, cardiac output. Uh, so uh, LVOT measurement is for left ventricular stroke volume, which times heart rate gives you cardiac output. And uh, there are other ways of measuring left ventricular filling pressure echocardiographically using mitral inflow Doppler, tissue Doppler, um, etc. One last question from uh, our chat box. Could you please suggest good books for echocardiography which would be easy to read? Easy to study. Yeah. Uh, so uh i'm not sure who is the uh, person who is um asking this uh, uh let me assume okay uh, if it is a medical student uh, then i don't think um, you should really bother about uh, you may not have the time to read echo and all at your stage uh, best way to learn would be to kind of just walk into the echo lab and uh, just observe um 
Uh, second thing is uh, you can, uh, there are a lot of uh, crisp uh, sessions, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, video recordings and things like that, uh, which are freely available online. Uh, so you can say mitral stenosis is what you're reading. You just uh, Google mitral stenosis on YouTube or uh, Google and it'll throw up something. Just look at those images. Uh, so that can be a very focused way of uh, learning. Somebody at a slightly more, uh, at a higher level who has uh, interest and who is uh, spending a, maybe a lot of time trying to uh, learn ECHO, uh, some uh, good books um, are one is ECHO Manual. Uh, that's a, a good book from the Mayo Clinic. Um, and it is quite concise also. Uh, then, of course, everybody knows uh, there, there is uh, Dr. Catherine uh, Otto's book. There is uh, practical echocardiography and a textbook of uh, echocardiography um, by Kathy Otto. Uh, she has written multiple books, including a textbook of echocardiography. Then there is uh, uh, Fagan Baum itself. Uh, these are standard books. Then there is the um, American Society of Echocardiography, uh, Comprehensive uh, Echocardiography, which is, these are all very good. Um, so you could use uh, any of these things. For a start, I think Echo Manual is quite, um, quite good. It's comprehensive as well as um, informative. Um, and it's not too, too, too extensive. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh... Dr. Jesu Kripa for not just telling us his, why he spoke, he was typing out the names of the books and he's put it into the chat box for those who are interested. Uh, names of four books, the Echo Manual, Practical Echo by Kathy Otto, Feigenbaum and the American Society of Echocardiography Comprehensive. So, uh, thank you, sir, for doing that for us. Um, thank you. Thank you for this session. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you for uh, 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 giving us uh, a beautiful session on autocorography. Over to uh, Dr. Prakash, the host. Thanks, Dr. Chris. Thank you, Dr. Chris. Uh, we would like to thank Dr. Jesu for this enlightening session on echocardiography. And also our moderator, Dr. Chris. And uh, we thank all the people who have logged in for this webinar. Just before you leave, I would just like to say that next Wednesday, Dr. Tom George would be taking us into a dive into the world of interventional radiology and all you need to know about the treatment of fibroids using uterine artery embolization. Thank you all. Meet you on the next webinar. We have a special webinar also coming up on Tuesday, which will be panel discussion on postpartum hemorrhage an obstetrician's nightmare done by the gynecology department of the believer sets. Thank you all. Have a nice day.